This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 18 of season 3 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, April 30th, 1910. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1910. The first section is that of the Westford, of Westford Center. Mrs. A.S. Wright, who has been spending the cold months with relatives in Waverly, has returned to town and opened her house, which has been undergoing some renovations. Mr. Newcomb and daughter, Miss Amy, are staying with Mrs. Wright. Miss Sarah W. Loker is enjoying a trip of 10 days or two weeks to Washington. Mr. and Mrs. Walter Wright spent last week at the Whitney Homestead. Mr. and Mrs. William A. Woodward entertained a group of friends at their home Saturday evening. Three tables of whist were enjoyed, after which refreshments were served. Whist was a card game uh, predecessor to bridge. Pearl Harmon had the misfortune to lose his faithful horse, Dolly, last week. The animal got cast. It says cast, C-A-S-T, but I think they meant caught, C-A-U-G-H-T. It got caught in its stall and was so badly injured that it had to be killed. Alonzo H. Sutherland also lost his family horse recently. H.W. Tarbell has a large force of workmen on the new Whitney Park and playgrounds. Donald Cameron has given a deed of about one half acre of land near the Academy, and Oscar R. Spaulding has also donated a portion of his land back of the Frost School. Of course, the academy at that time was what we know as Rodenbush Community Center. These additions are much appreciated and add to the size and symmetry of the tract. Some of the land that is a combination of ledge, rock, and moisture, and at best was never anything but the poorest of pasturage, is something of a proposition to make clear, drained, and leveled. Miss Hazel Hartford has been selected for the graceful ceremony of unveiling the new Soldiers Monument at the dedication Memorial Day. Hazel uh, was the 17-year-old granddaughter of Wesley O. Hawks, who was a Civil War veteran who served in the 31st, 31st Mass Infantry for three years and then re-enlisted in the 60th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, Wesley also was an active member of the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the Civil War Veterans Association. The Wright and Fletcher store published a picture postcard showing Hazel's and others standing next to the flag draped statue at this ceremony. And the drape they used was a large uh, U.S. flag. Miss May Balch is teaching at Framingham for the remainder of the school term. After four months suspension of travel and after much conference between the management, the railroad commissioners, and the selectmen and town council, we are glad to hear that the cars are to resume service between Brookside and the center next Monday. According to time-honored custom, the churches of the town will unite in a union service the Sunday preceding Memorial Day. and. And this year, according to rotation, the services will be with the Congregational Church. The Ladies' Missionary Society of the Congregational Church met with Mrs. Mary E. Fletcher last week Thursday with a full attendance. The program for the afternoon was interestingly arranged from the book, The Gospel in Latin Lands, which has been the study of the winter. After the close of the meeting, Mrs. Fletcher served afternoon tea, and those present enjoyed a pleasant social time, and those who might not have already done so inspected Mrs. Fletcher's pretty new home. The book mentioned here, uh, the full title is The Gospel in Latin Lands, Outline Studies of Protestant Work in the Latin Countries of Europe and America by Reverend Francis Edward Clark and Harriet Elizabeth Clark, was published in 1909. It was the second series of books on the study of missions. The next paragraph is called Birthday Party. 
Happy birthdays, especially if made memorable with a party, are always one of the treasured memories of childhood. Mrs. Homer M. Seavey recently gave a very pleasant party for Miss Marjorie, the only daughter in the household with three brothers. It was the lady it was the little lady's twelfth birthday anniversary, and a group of school girl school girl friends were invited for an afternoon. There were games, music, and dancing, and a birthday supper, of which an abundance of cake and ice cream and a birthday cake with candles were enjoyable features. The young hostess was the recipient of some pretty gifts. Those present were Mrs. Marjorie Cameron, Pauline Wallace, Adrith Carter, Hazel Hartford, Hilda Isles, Ethel Mills, Pauline Dole, Beatrice Sutherland, Lillian Sutherland, and Evelyn Hamlin. The next paragraph is entitled Wedding. A very pretty home wedding took place at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Alec McDougall on the Boston Road Wednesday of last week when their only daughter, Henrietta May, was united in marriage to Albert Whittemore Hayward, son of Mr. and Mrs. George W. Hayward. The ceremony took place at 6 o'clock and was performed by Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey. The bridesmaid was Miss Annie Blodgett, an intimate friend of the bride, and the best man was Alistair McDougall, only brother of the bride. The bride's gown was of dainty white muslin cut en prince. The room was prettily decorated for the occasion with flowers, carnations, greenery, and the beautiful blossoms of early spring. After the ceremony, a wedding collation was served, and later the happy couple took their departure for a wedding trip. They will make their home with Mr. Haywood's parents. They were the recipients of many presents, both useful and ornamental, among which were some particularly handsome pieces of sterling silver. Both these young people are well known in our village and they take with them in their new life many good wishes for happiness and prosperity. The next pa uh, paragraph is the Tadmuck Club. At the meeting of the Tadmuck Club Tuesday afternoon in Library Hall, the program was to have been Old China and Pottery by Miss Clarissa Sampson of Medford. But owing to the illness of the speaker, Mrs. Sarah Swan Griffin of Lowell substituted with a paper on Ralph Waldo Emerson. It certainly proved a most happy and able substitution, for Mrs. Griffin is an able speaker and a thorough student of the Sage of Concord, which was Emerson's nickname whom she, she rightly called one of the foremost scholars and thinkers of his time. To those who care for the writing of Emerson, and most members of literary societies are pretty apt to, in greater or lesser degree, Mrs. Griffin portrayed with discriminating and entertaining insight Emerson the man, the scholar, the poet, the essayist, the lecturer, and the philosopher. Poems were interpreted by Miss Clara Smith and Mr. Bailey. Um, Reverend, Reverend Mr. Benjamin Bailey also added to the program with some interesting personal recollections of Emerson. Uh, Emerson, or uh, uh, Ralph Bailey, Reverend Bailey was born in 1829, and Emerson was born in 1803, so they were contemporaries within a generation of each other. At the business meeting, the same list of officers who have served the club so acceptably were re-elected, namely Miss Sarah W. Loker, President, Miss Ella Hildreth, Vice President, Mrs. William A. Woodward, Secretary and Treasurer. Mrs. Loker, after five years as President, rather sought a release from the duties, but with a hearty unanimous choice of the members and with the good of the club at heart, consented to retain the chair for another season, bespeaking the cordial cooperation that has always characterized the workings of the club. The next meeting will be the annual social. The date has been changed from May 10th, as given in the calendar, to May 17th, one week later. An attractive program by outside talent, followed by refreshments, is being planned. Next, we come to the About Town section. The warrant for the annual meeting of the First Parish United Church, uh, Unitarian Church is posted in the vestry of the church and will be held Saturday evening, April 30th at 8 o'clock. 
Clarence R.P. Decatur has greatly improved the beauty and utility of shade trees and shrubbery by setting them on his lawn. The lawn acknowledges it by looking better also. Just look out of the electric car window next Monday and see if more than half has been told that might be. Uh, the, De the Decaturs lived in the Pelatiah Fletcher house at 54 Lowell Road, and in 1910, the trolley ran right down the side of that road. At the ball game last Saturday afternoon on Fletcher Park between Westford Academy and a team from West Chelmsford, the team from the Academy Hilltops won by the close calculation of 15 to 12. The Westford Tigers defeated the Westford Lions 25 to 11 on Westford Common last Saturday afternoon. James Ralphness and family have arrived into the house of John H. Decatur on the Lowell Road. He was a former resident of the town several years ago, living on the Providence Road. Miss Alma Decatur, who left town last week for California, was gladdened along the way by the fragrance of spring blossoms until the lake region of Chicago was reached, where, quote, announced by all the trumpets of the sky, arrived the snow, end quote and spring flowers were in vacation season under two feet of snow. That quote is the first line and a half of the poem, The Snowstorm by Ralph Waldo Emerson, a favorite of the wardsman correspondent, Sam Taylor, published in 1841 and fittingly uh, part of this uh, program since the Tadbunk Club also talked about Emerson. The next uh, section is for the fortnightly club. There were two crowds at the meeting of the fortnightly club last week, Friday evening, a crowded house and a crowded program. The meeting was called to order by Ernest H. Dane, chairman of the evening, who introduced the program and its exponents. Mrs. Arthur T. Blodgett and her youthful bright son led off with vocal and instrumental music. Mrs. Glenn entertained with reading and sensible humor. Arthur T. Blodgett and Gilman F. Wright called up the lively act with violin suggestions and had to be called to account for some more such. Harold Gould read a funny story in a funny way, as likewise did Edwin H. Gould, and Mrs. Edwin H. Gould read some straight truth, dealing with edification, leastwise there was no gambling to, to the contrary. Mrs. Walter Wyman and Mrs. William Wyman were duets in reading. As variety entertainer between the acts that kept enthusiasm well-balanced and useful came George E. Gould with the speeches, songs, dialogues, and whistling gigs of the phonograph. Who says that the fortnightly club is not alive? It is the most lively article this side of town warrants. That club was uh, 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 used the uh, right lion um, schoolhouse in northwest Westford for the, their meeting place and was primarily for people that lived in the north part of Westford. The next section is the Forge Village section. Communion services will be held at St. Andrew's Mission Sunday morning, May 1st at 9 o'clock. The usual evening service will be held at 7 o'clock. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher, who has been in Sioux Falls, South, Deca South Dakota the past two weeks, expect to arrive in, in air Friday evening and will conduct the services here. Mrs. Michael Keefe and son David of Townsend Harbor were guests Saturday of Mr. and Mrs. John Carmichael. Mrs. Jenny Cotterell is spending this week as the guest of Mr. and Mrs. John Jones of Worcester. The Forge Village Lions journeyed to Groton last Saturday afternoon and defeated the Groton School second team by the score of 3-1. to one. The excellent battery work of the Spinner Brothers and the fine feeling of S. Campbell landed the game. Mr. Campbell is a member of the Jolly Jumpers of Lowell and will play with the Lions this season in the Stony Brook League. The Tigers will play the St. Mary's baseball team at Ayer Saturday afternoon, April 30th. Batteries for the Tigers will be Boucher and Dumont and Bowler and Sullivan for Ayer. Cameron School was closed Monday. The teachers visiting the schools in Lowell.
John Goffs, a bricklayer employed on the new mill which Abbott and Company are erecting, fell from the staging Wednesday of last week at 9 o'clock. After he was picked up, he returned to work until noontime when he suffered great pain. An examination made by the doctor disclosed the fact that four ribs were broken, and he will be laid up for some time. Mr. and Mrs. Smith and family of Keithley, England, arrived on the White Star Liner, Megantic, Thursday afternoon of last week. They will reside with their daughter, Miss Sadie Smith. This was uh, Charles W. and Bridget Curran Smith, who arrived from Keithley, and their daughter, Sadie, who was already in Westford, was her, her, correct, her full name was Sarah Ann Smith, uh, who in 1914 would marry Billy Kelly. Percy Wilson of Keithley, England, is visiting Mrs. Oldham and family on Pond Street. Joseph LaCourse, the 10 months old son of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph LaCourse, died Wednesday morning at the home of his parents on Pleasant Street. The next section is called Fair, F-A-I-R. The Ladies of St. Andrew's Mission held their annual fair and recreation hall Saturday afternoon and evening, and it proved to be one of the most enjoyable affairs ever given by the ladies. The doors were opened at 3 o'clock, and the sales began immediately. The apron and children's clothing table did a rushing business and was all sold out and received many orders. This table was in charge of Mrs. R.D. Prescott, Mrs. F.A. Sweat, and Mrs. Nelson Prescott. Next came the candy stall in charge of Miss Bertha Collins and Miss Marion Lord. Their stall was elaborately decorated in yellow and white, and homemade delicious candies were quickly disposed of. Next in line was the fancy table in charge of Miss Edith Foster and Miss E. Marion Sweat. Many dainty and useful articles were to be obtained here at moderate prices. The table was beautifully arranged with small potted spruce trees and evergreens. Many of the articles were made by the young women themselves, and the, and the sold-out sign was soon posted. The flower table was presided over by Mrs. Henry Catchpole and Mrs. Holbrook. The fragrant flowers attracted many customers, and soon everybody was decorated with many different flowers. The grocery table was in charge of Mrs. Hugh A. Ferguson and Mrs. William H. Fernald. This table attracted the matrons, who readily recognized the delicious homemade jellies and the variety of good things usually kept by the model housekeeper. Coffee and chicken sandwiches were served at 5 o'clock. I don't think I've ever seen chicken sandwiches referenced in the wardsman before. Mrs. A. H. Comey, Mrs. David Lord, and Mrs. George H. Sanborn presided. Their tables were tastefully arranged with cut flowers. Mrs. F. A. Sweet and Mrs. R. D. Prescott had charge of the ice cream, and the demand was much larger than the supply. A charmingly arranged affair was the huge fish pond in charge of Mrs. E. May, Flo May Lord. This pot was the center of attraction for the children who were, who were greatly pleased with their bargains. In the evening, dancing was enjoyed by a large number. Music was furnished by Miss E. M. Sweat at the piano and the Luigi Brothers of Air, Violin, and Cello. A large number of out-of-town people were present during the evening. The, the ladies deserve credit for the able manner in which the fair was handled. A large sum was turned into the treasury. That's the news in Westford for the week ending April 30th, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.